Kingdom Solutions to Financial Problems. I want to focus on specifically one of the most important keys in the kingdom for living financially free. I'm going to give you a secret. One of the secrets Jesus talked about when he talked about I will give you the keys of the kingdom. One of the most important kingdom keys is the principle of management. Write that down. We're going to talk about what? The principle of management. Management is probably the most absent component in churches. The average pastor in this city graduated from a seminary or a Bible school and there was no class on management. And they told him or her, you are ready to start the ministry. That is why most churches are suffering, broke, or attracting broke people. (laughs) And that is why most of the people in the churches in the city are financially embarrassed. They quote scripture, but don't experience those scriptures. They claim God owns the Cattle on a thousand hills, and they still renting. Don't get quiet tonight. This is embarrassing to God. They claim that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, and for the last 2,000 years, the wicked still has it. And the reason is because they have avoided the most important principle of kingdom life and its management. The average pastor can't even spell the word. Management. If you ask me, What should you study to prepare yourself for the ministry? My answer would be, study business management, not theology. (laughs) Because... A kingdom is a government. And a kingdom is administration. And governments are in the business of management of resources. And the key to good government is the effective management, delegation, and distribution of resources. Religious people, you're sitting in front of one right now, don't look back, (laughs) believe that God operates in emotions. So somehow they believe that if they can just get God to feel sorry for them, they can get anything they want. And that's why they're still broke. Let's talk about the crisis right now. 
And everybody should get a copy of this CD or DVD, please. Because you won't hear everything I say. You've got to listen hard, but you won't get it all. What caused the crisis right now, according to the analysts in your country and around the world? Well, according to them, the cause of the crisis is greed. Do you remember that? Everybody say greed. greed. Now, they are correct. So I think it's important to define what greed is. Write this down. Uh, greed is really the mismanagement of resources for personal benefit. That's greed. What is greed? The mismanagement of resources for personal benefit. That's greed. In other words, a greedy spirit will manipulate resources so that he or she could be the ultimate benefit only. Jesus said something about greed. One of the kingdom killers. Matthew chapter 7, sorry Mark chapter 7, verse 22. Jesus said, these are the things that destroy a man. Greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Now if you read those words carefully, they are all related. A greedy person is usually an arrogant person. And you arrogant and greedy, you got to be foolish. That word folly means you got to be foolish. And to be foolish, you got to have deceit. He says all of these evils come from where? Inside and make a man unclean. Inside means they are in his mind. Luke chapter 12, Jesus repeats this sentiment concerning greed. He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of Greed. He says, watch out. That means it can get you unawares. You got to watch yourself. Greed is, is so sneaky. You might think you are holy and righteous, and really you're simply greedy. It can, it can, it can sneak up on you. Watch out, he says, these are evils. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions, Jesus said. I think of Mr. Madoff tonight. Simply greed. He lost everything that he thought was his life. And now his life consists of 12 feet by 8 feet. Concrete. Is that where you're headed? Trying to get money? We're talking about solutions to, tonight. Uh, let's talk about God's dominion strategy. Because this is the foundation of you becoming financially smart. Genesis 2 verse 4. Now, you never read this verse before, okay? I know that. So let's read it again. You all know... Whenever you come into my presence, I normally find verses you never saw before. This is one of them right here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. It says, when the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. Why? For means because... The Lord had not yet sent rain on the earth. Why? Because there was no man to work the ground. Now, let's not rush through this verse. This is a powerful verse about you and about the earth. First of all, we got a record of God creating the heavens and the earth. And then it says there was no life on the earth. Can you go back and imagine a massive planet spinning in space with just rock? 
hard slush. No trees, no animals, no grass, no beauty, no plants. He didn't allow anything to grow. He didn't allow anything to grow. He didn't allow anything to grow. Notice it says, because God had not sent what? Rain. In other words, God refused to let anything grow, and it was his fault. Stay with me. So God was withholding growth. Read it carefully. He was holding back progress and stopping development. He didn't want anything to advance. He didn't allow anything to come to life. He kept everything buried. He didn't allow anything to grow. Why? Because he had a problem. What was his problem? Come on, students. Tell me, what's the problem? Last line. There was no man. Okay. <laughs> the Bible says God didn't allow anything to grow or progress because there was no man to work the ground. What you see here is God's motivation for the creation of man. I just gave you something you should write down. I'm going to say it again. God himself says he didn't allow anything to grow, anything to develop. He didn't allow anything to progress because he was lacking something. What was he lacking? He said it. He says, I was lacking man, a species that would work the ground. I thought I would help you and do your research for you. And I discovered that the word work that God used here is the word ergon, and it means management. Shocked? Yes, you are. God says, I refuse to let anything grow because I don't have a manager. True. This verse changed my life. I was a teenager when I understood this verse because I was complaining to God concerning why I was poor. I was living in an island where I still live, seven miles wide, 20 miles long, living in a wooden house on four rocks, sleeping on a dirty wooden floor on a mat. And I became angry at God because my parents took me to church every week, sometimes three times a week, and we were still poor. And I said, God, you don't exist. You can't exist. You only like white people. I was serious about it. I was 13. I became angry. And I said, forget all this Sunday school stuff and all this Bible stuff because it ain't working. Teenager. God said something to me as a kid. i never forget. God says, I don't make rich people nor poor people. I only make people. Some become rich. Some become poor, son, depending on how they manage. I changed my life. And then I found this verse. 16 years old, I was reading the Bible, and I read this verse. It says, God didn't allow anything to grow, anything to spring up, anything to progress, because he was lacking a manager to manage the earth. So why did God create you? Not to have worship services. Not to sing in the choir. Not to be an usher. He didn't create you to be no preacher or no pastor, no apostle, no deacon, nothing. He wanted a manager. Go ahead, stone me, I don't care. I'm giving you the most important message you ever heard in your life. That's why you're struggling from dollar to dollar. You are a bad manager. Take a deep breath. Good. God says, I don't allow anything to grow until I find a manager. And God actually stops growth 
where there is no manager. He stops it. Let's take this a step further. Therefore, this verse in the first section of the Bible tells us God's primary assignment for man. It actually tells us that the principal motivation why God created you was because he wanted you to dominate the earth. Okay, we know that in chapter 1. But he says he wants it to happen through management of resources. God created you not because he needed a singer. He didn't need a preacher. You know, people ask me, how did you build an organization from seven people in your apartment to a global organization affecting over 100 countries? I said, not because I studied theology, but because my master's degree is in business. I run a business. Why? I work for the government. Your primary assignment is God needed a manager. Write this down. The divine goal of mankind is the extension of the culture of heaven on earth. And that requires management. And therefore the divine strategy of God was for mankind to dominate earth through work. Everybody say work. There was no man to work. Can you imagine the creator was held up because he had no manager? There's some things we learned from this very important passage. And that is number one, God protects his resources from bad management. Number two, God withholds resources from bad management. Number three, God won't allow growth where there is bad management. Number four, God will never answer a prayer requested by anyone who is a bad manager. Can I put it another way? Please write this down. I've come to the conclusion that the principal key of kingdom on earth given to mankind by God is this. Management. Say it. Management. Say it again. Management. Now I know some of you are having problems with me right now. Because you are so religious, you never heard this word in a church meeting. And that's why you lost your house. That's why you're working for someone else all the time. That's why you can't pay your bills. Because you never heard this word in church, and it shows up in the Bible in the first chapter. Religion is a killer. It destroys because it takes away the very thing you need the most, management. Let me tell you something. Management demands work and religion makes you lazy. This is why Christians love miracles above management. Management. Oh, Lord. Let me don't touch that. Uh, miracles cancel management. Some of you think God likes miracles. He does not. Miracles destroy the principle of management. Miracles are like the lottery. You gain without effort. That's why I hate gambling. Gambling is an attempt for you to gain without work. Yes. Yes. 
Why are you, oh. don't you get quiet on me now? Yeah. I'm going to walk down there and prophesy. Oh, I discern on. that you buy lottery. Don't get me mad. I'll call your name tonight. <laughs> All right now. Yeah, lottery is ungodly because it cancels work. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Everybody say management. management. Say it loud. Management. One more time. So you came here to learn how to make money tonight. And that's your problem. Money runs from the one who pursues it, the Bible says. Money is attracted to management. I'm going to prove that in a minute from the Bible. Do everything I'm saying, it took me 30 years to prepare for this one session. So don't worry, I ain't crazy. I got you all set up. I'm setting you up. I'm about to dismantle your idea about miracles. Miracles are for lazy people. <laughs> Do you remember in the Bible? When the people came to Jesus and they said, show us some miracle. We want to see miracles. You got to read his answer. His answer was, only a wicked and an adulterous generation seek for miracles. Don't look now, but there's a wicked person right behind you. Yeah, and that's what's wrong with us. Let me tell you something. I want to define management for you. You've never written this before. And if you work for a company, write it down, take it back to your department. Management is defined as, write it down, management is the effective, efficient, correct, and timely use of another person's property and resources for the purpose for which they were delegated with a view to producing the expected added value back to the person. Please buy this CD so you can rewind it 10 times. Management is what? It is the effective, efficient, correct, and timely use of another person's property and resources for the purpose for which they delegated it with a view to producing the expected added value. That's management. Management automatically implies you don't own the material. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Management also implies that when you bring it back, it's supposed to be better. Yeah. It's yeah. supposed to have more value. That's management. God says, I won't allow anything to grow. Because I don't have anyone to add value to what I'm about to create. And I want it to be used effectively, efficiently, and timely for the purpose for which I gave it to them. That's why God is upset at lazy people. You know... I tell you what, you're all taking too long to write. So let me just take this. I got so much to give you tonight. I want you to get it right now. Okay, everybody say management and prayer. Management. Take a deep breath. Tell your neighbor something's coming. something's coming. So sit up straight. All right, watch this. This principle, therefore, teaches some important things. Number one, God will never give you what you pray for. Only what you can manage. Here you are praying for a thousand bucks and God says, wait a minute, I gave you a hundred yesterday. You can't even pay ten dollars tithes. Okay, okay. You're praying for a big house and the house you're renting, you keep it dirty. Oh, say it again. Yes. You can't manage another person's property. How dare I give you property of your own, he says. Don't get quiet now. Come on. 
You pray for a bigger church and God says, you know something? You can't manage the church you're renting. You pray for souls. Oh God, give me souls. And the people you got now, you can't manage. So God protects them from you. If you get the million dollars you're praying for, it will kill you. You cannot manage $500. You spend 200 bucks on a dress, $150 on your, your hair, and put 20 bucks in the offering and ask God for a million dollars? Is God stupid or what? Y'all don't want me to teach on money and management. You know why God will never give you your own business first? Never. He'll always give you employment first. Because he wants to watch you handle other people's property. Including their time. Write this down. It gets easier. God wants you to be an economist. What's an economist? To economize means to get the maximum out of the minimum. The average person in this building is not an economist. Because they don't know the value of what they have already. And I was telling the folks in Baltimore yesterday, or was the day before, I told them, look, you have the audacity to tell God that you are broke and unemployed. And in your house is an oven that you only use twice a week. That's abuse. That's bad management. You got an oven sitting there idle for six days of the week. You only use it on Sunday. You could at least get some flour and water with some raisins, bake some cookies every day, put them in a plastic bag, and make yourself a factory out of your own kitchen. That's management. No, you lazy thing. You're looking for a job. That's your problem. Uh Uh-oh, take a deep breath, please. It's bad management. Write this down. To economize means to get the most out of the least. You got clothing in your closet you don't wear. And they've been there for 10 years, and you put on too much weight, they'll never fit you again. And you tell me you ain't got no money? Take a deep breath. All right, it gets easier. To economize means to add value to your gift. I put it this way. Uh, Answered prayer is regulated by your capacity to manage. God will never give you what you pray for. He regulates his answer by what you can manage. So he watches your management. To see if you can handle what you're asking for. Never pray beyond your management. Money. Money is easy to get. Money is supposed to come to you. So if it keeps moving away from you, it is telling you something. You can't manage. I'm serious about this. Let me show you some scriptures here. Because God does not encourage waste. 
And that's God's problem with most of us. We don't manage. We waste things. Uh, I put it to you this way. The reason why God created tithing, tithing has nothing to do with giving God money. Can I say it again? Yes. Just for the CD purpose. <laughs> tithing has nothing to do with giving God money. God doesn't need nothing from you. You couldn't even give God nothing. Everything on the earth already belongs to God. He don't need nothing from us. So when God sets something up, it's not because he needs it. Tithing and offerings is God's management training program for mankind. Boy, this is so important. God doesn't need a penny from us. And yet he tells us 10% of everything is mine. We only think of money. And that's our problem. If you get 10 pairs of shoes, one of them ain't yours. If you get 10 dresses, one of them ain't yours. If you bought 10 oranges, one of them is not yours. If you got 24 hours in a day, 2 hours and 40 minutes don't belong to you. I ain't got no time to pray. What are you talking about? You got 2 and a hours and 40 minutes that don't belong to you. You are a thief every day when you don't use those two hours and 40 minutes for God's purposes. You are a thief. A tired thief. <laughs> Sleeping on God's time. You spend two hours, four hours, eight hours watching cable television and don't give God the two hours and 40 minutes that belong to him. 10%. You can't even manage two hours and 40 minutes. You're trying to get money. You ain't money, money in your problem. Management is your problem. God could any time of day command you to give the dress away in your closet. One of them ain't yours. So tithing and offering is not about money. It's about management. Can you consistently, God says, put aside 10% of everything for my purposes? That's tithing. Can you consistently? Now, now, now let, me, let me tell you something. Listen to me. 100% of everything belongs to God. What did I say? 100% of everything belongs to God. No, no. Say it again. What did I say? 100% of everything belongs to God. Okay. So, if God blesses you with a paycheck of $1,000, how much of that belongs to God? Okay, you're doing good. You're the smart. Now, how much did God say to put aside for his work? 10%. How many is left? 90%. Which one of those belong to God? Oh, ah, you're getting smart. Okay. All right. So then why would God, if he owns all 1,000, want you to put aside 10% if all but still belongs to him? Why? Because it's not about the money. It's about your ability to put it aside. Your will, your control, your discipline to put it aside. He's after your discipline. If you can manage the 10% properly, then he is happy to trust you with the 90% that's left. But because you've been unfaithful in the 10%, you keep losing the 90%, so you end up with no percent. That's why you're broke. And so you tell God, I can't pay tithes this week, things tough. We're in crisis right now, God. You got to figure this out. Things too rough. God is saying, what are you talking about? 
Your salvation is in the time. Let me take you one step further. This is what tithing does to you. Number one, what's the first word? Accountability. Accountability. Write it down. Now, each one of these words is management. If you keep paying your tithes and giving your offering, you automatically first become accountable. What's the second word? Discipline. Discipline. For you to put that aside every single time, it takes control. What's the third word? Honesty. Honesty. For you to be a tither, that means no one's watching except God. And he knows if you paint it or not. You can lie to everybody else, but God knows if you pay 10%. That means it makes you honest. And managers must be honest. What's the fourth word? Diligence. Diligence. Diligence means that you work at it constantly to make sure you don't steal that 10%. That's what managers are supposed to do. What's the next word? Oh my God. That's what's wrong with managers. They are unfaithful. And it takes faithfulness to tithe. What's the last one? Trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. For you to manage a tithe, God got to trust you every time. I just gave you the characteristics of a manager. They are accountable. They are honest. They are diligent. They are faithful. They are trustworthy. Jesus, one day, showed top-class management. One day, he had 5,000 people in a field, and they were all hungry, and there was, they say, plus women and children, so they must have had about 12,000, and he is about to, to distribute some resources to them. I want you to watch him at work, okay? Matthew 6, verse 40. It says, So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. That's administration, organization. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes. That's the resources. Looking up to the one who owns them, he thanked them for letting him use them. That's appreciation. That means they don't belong to you. That's all right. Someone else's property. He broke it, then he gave them to his disciples, and they gave it to the people. Delegation, it's management, delegation, watch him. He also divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. That's customer service. <laughs> Give God a hand for good customer service. That's good. That's good. All were satisfied. Now watch his management kick in. It says, and the disciples, he told them to pick up every crumb. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to imagine this. 12,000 people in an open field, breaking bread and pieces of fish. Now how in the world are you going to find pieces of bread, crumbs, and pieces of fish, bone and stuff in the grass? He says, pick up Every crumb. In the book of Matthew, it actually says it. He says, and he said to them, pick up every crumb and bring it to me. I don't want to waste nothing. That's what I'm talking about. This country is built on a culture of waste. And it is in the church. Who go direct to the buffets after service? You, and what do you do at that buffet? Now you know the plate is too small for what you want to do. You pile it up, sit at the table, and half is left in the plate. You are a bad manager and God takes notes. Cheryl, waste food. (laughs) That ain't funny. He made them pick up the crumbs. It was not the crumbs that were important. It was the lesson he was teaching. You don't waste the crumb. When we started our ministry, we had a building a little smaller than this. Man, I would teach as if I was teaching to a million people. 
we had our one camera set up in the center. And we would clean everything. We had our sets, speakers, everything. I tell him, this is, this is, this is God's property. No paper in the bathroom. I said, and don't call no janitor for nothing. If you find it, fix it. Why? Because God's watching us. And if we can't manage this little building, that ain't ours. He'll never trust us with one of our own. And we began our national television show in that little building. We used to convert the stage into a set for TV. And we took our one camera and we'd move it and shoot it different ways so we can have different cutaways. And we'd work it every inch we used. And our program became the number one program in the country for 10 years. And when folks came to see where they shot it, they went into shock. Did you shoot it here? Yes, sir. <laughs> we thought you had a big studio. No, we don't. We got a big mind. Yeah. Give God a hand for management. Yeah. I remember when our prime minister came to be a guest on our show. He had to come to a little shopping center all the police and all the guards, and he came walking. He says, Brother Miles, is this where you... I said, yes, sir, this is it. This is the studio. He said, I thought you had a big place. I said, I got a big mind. He said, you manage this well. And there was the head of my country sitting in that little building on a stage for one hour, interviewed by me. And that show became the highest viewing show in the country's history. From a little place that we managed. Today, we've built the largest meeting place in the country. We own it. We have block to block property. The whole block is ours. We own 57 acres on the beach. When you are faithful over another man's property, God will give you property of your own. I want to say to Grace Church, make this as if it's yours. God's watching you. He's watching how you park your cars in the people's parking spaces. He's watching how you handle the bathroom and the tissue on the floor. He, he's watching how the kids write and mark. So he's watching everything. Can they handle the big times God is watching for? Can they handle the big times? management. He made them pick up every crumb. Ah, here's something to remember about management. Everyone write this down, please. Management is simply diligence with resources. You can put it another way. Proverbs 13, 22 says these words. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Okay. But the next statement is the only one you quote. You don't quote the first part. A good man leaves an inheritance to who? His children's children. And the wealth of the... <laughs> now this is the part we don't like, see? It says, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Notice they're tied together. A good man. Everybody say good man. Good man. If you're a good man, certain things show up in your life. Oh, I feel like staying here for two more days because we got to talk about this man. This, this, this is going to save you in the crisis. Ain't no crisis in a good man's life. A good man has so much that he has enough to give to his children's children now. Let me say it slow. Wow, come on, come on. A good man has so much now that he has enough for his unborn grandchildren already. Yes. And he said, that man is the man who will get what's stored up by the sinners. That's good. That's good. Can we stay here for a couple of minutes? Let's just stay here for a couple of minutes. He says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A car is not an inheritance. Because it can't last until the children's children are alive. 
So don't tell me you got a car for your grandchild. <laughs> clothing is wearing out every day. It can't be clothing. <laughs> the only heritage that the Bible really teaches as generational heritage is real estate. Now write that down quick. What is it? Real estate. God never gave Adam shoes, clothes, house. He never gave Adam food. Never gave Adam desk and chair. He gave Adam real estate. He gave him a garden. God never promised Abraham food and clothes and cows and herd. He gave him real estate. There's a land, he says. God never gave Isaac Food and clothes, he promised him real estate. God never gave Moses food and clothes, he promised him real estate. God never gave Jacob food and clothes, he says, I got a land for you. That's why they call it real estate. It's the only estate that's real. Come on, come on. I'm getting at something. You are not wealthy until you own land. I'm giving you an assignment tonight. When I come back next year, I want to see proof that you got a deposit on a piece of property. Are you listening to me? That's real wealth. Let me quote what Jesus said. Because some of y'all are so spiritual, you're completely useless. <laughs> not you, the one sitting behind you. Don't, I'm not talking to you now, okay? Not you. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Jesus said these words. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For to them belongs, not a religion, but the kingdom of heaven. He said, And blessed are those who have been mourning, Matthew 5, all their lives looking for answers for they can now be filled. The kingdom has arrived. And then he kicked in. Blessed are those who are meek for they shall inherit heaven. But that's what you preach. That's not what he said. He said blessed are the meek for they shall inherit real estate. Am I right? Yeah. You want to go to heaven. He wants you to have earth. Write the word meek down. Meek. Everybody say meek. meek. Say it loud. Meek. Now the word meek, if you look it up in the Hebrew language, it is the opposite of what you've been taught. The word meek means, write this down, controlled strength. Controlled power. Meek means self-discipline. So now let's quote it in the original text concept. Blessed are those who control themselves, discipline themselves, not buy expensive clothes and car they can't afford. They take lunch rather than buy it. Oh, yeah, y'all don't like this stuff I'm talking about. Blessed are those who are self-controlled, who will not go every night to eat and go to the clouds and waste their money on fine fubu. <laughs> Blessed are those who are self-controlled and they save their money and put deposit on property for they shall inherit the earth. Amen. Amen. That's why you're still renting. You eat too much. Food you can't afford. There's a book I want to recommend. It's called The Automatic Millionaire. Go to the bookstore, buy one, read it in the next three weeks. And then call me. The Automatic Millionaire. 
I made my son and daughter read it. Because it, it describes what I did with my life. My wife and I, I tell you, when we got married, you know what we did? We got married, had no money. And we came out of college, broke. And I said, me, I'm going to be just like God said. I'm going to be a good man. So, my wife's mother and father said, you could stay with us as long as you need. I said, thank you. And I lived with my mother-in-law and my father-in-law in one bedroom for four years. Why? We wanted to save our money. We had nothing to prove to nobody. We had a vision. We took our money, we bought our own property in a fantastic location where the, 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 the value keeps going up. And we built our own house with our own money as we stayed with the mom and law. Mm -hmm. And now we got a house worth over $1.2 million, all paid for, three cars all paid for, including the Jaguar. We got enough property that worth $2 million, all paid for, and you still broke. Yeah. Why? I'm too proud to be in my mother-in-law. No, it's called discipline. You know why God sometimes sends crisis? To send you back to the class you missed. Yeah. Wow. I got to go back and live with my mama. God says, yep, you missed that class. Go back. I want to show you how to save some money. Stop competing with people who ain't worth competing with. The Joneses are living on credit. <laughs> so forget the Joneses tonight and follow the plan of God. Everybody say management. 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 You got a business? When that money comes in, don't you spend that money on yourself. Put it back in the business. Grow the business. Manage the business. Why? Because if you are disciplined, you will reap later. By the way, uh, oh, I tell you, I need more days. I got 32 slides. This is slide number four. I'm in trouble now. Listen, let me read this verse again. King James says, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. The New International Version, it says, the sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. The Phillips translation says, the wealth controls wicked that was earmarked for the righteous. Okay, let me tell you what they all say. This is amazing. God says to his own people, hey y'all, guess what? The wicked has all your money. <laughs> now, 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 let me tell you, this ain't funny. You shouldn't quote this verse as some Claim to fame. You should be ashamed of this verse. Don't you ever quote it again. This quote is a, a mark of disgrace for you as a believer. You should never be proud of that verse. God says the wicked has your money. You don't quote that. You should be ashamed of that. Let me put it another way. God knows who has your money. The wicked. You never ask God a question about it. Here's a question I asked God years ago. How did they get it? Uh -huh. <laughs> if it's mine, how did they get it? God says, I gave it to them. That's how I know who has it. I said, why? He said, because they are better managers than you. You speak in tongues too much. You sing in the choir too much. You shout too much. Listen to me. God doesn't give money to worshipers. He gives money to managers. Mm. 
That's why you are employed by ungodly people. No, this doesn't make sense. You are God's son, God's daughter, and you work for a sinner. Something's wrong with that. That picture, something's wrong with that baby. Well, that means you got to study what's going on here. If you got people who love God and you have to get paid by a sinner. Something's wrong with that. How come you don't own the company? And they work for you. Yes. Wow. Take a deep breath. Yeah. So you want money, huh? Money's easy. He knows who has it. He even tells you who has it. And he tells you whose stuff they have. I believe the worst thing that ever entered the body of Christ is this strange philosophy and doctrine of money coming. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You don't stand in the middle of life and say, money cometh to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm not attacking anybody. But you got to watch these doctrines. These stuff, but I claim it. You better be. That's why you're still broke. You've been claiming since 1982. You still ain't own no house. You ain't got no car. You catching the bus and you still claiming. How long going to take you to figure it out? Hey, boy, say management. Say, Lord, teach me to manage, please. He gives it to the wicked, not because they're holy, but because they're managers. He withholds from bad management. I, I thought it'd be good to read this verse. Probably 10. Read it out loud. Please, verse 4. Go. Lazy hands makes a man poor, but a diligent hand brings wealth. Diligent means management. Another verse I thought was interesting. Proverbs 12, 27. Everybody read, go. The lazy man does not roast his game, but the diligent man prizes his possession. That means he takes care of what he has. Maximizes it. Proverbs chapter 13, 4. Read. The sluggard, lazy man craves and gets nothing, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Craving. Hey, yes, I'm going to gamble with some dice. I'm going to pull the lever. Yes, I desire my money. I'm going to buy me some lottery numbers. Yes, sir. I say, what's the number tonight? Yeah, 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 yeah. God says you desire and you crave and you get nothing. All the money on earth is still here. So when they tell you there's a credit crunch, don't believe them. Money just hiding. It went into hiding. Why? Because some guys in Wall Street mismanage. When you mismanage money, it runs away. Tell your neighbor, you broke? <laughs> tell them that's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign. Proverbs 21, verse 5, read. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. When you want quick money, it goes away. But if you're diligent, manage. It leads to what? Profit. That doesn't say P-R-O-F, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. <laughs> that says P-R-O-F. IT. God wants you to have plenty profit. You don't get profit by prophesying. That's what he's saying. You get it by management. I say the Lord thy God says he shall bless you with much money. That's a lie. He can tell you some ideas to go to work. That's what he's going to tell you. Oh man, I'm about to get myself in trouble. 
Every time you pray for money, God will give you an idea. Write it down. God don't give you money. He gives you ideas. And your problem is you're religious. You don't want ideas. You want cash. It ain't money you lack. It's management of ideas. That's what you're lacking. I'm going to come back here and do a three-day business management seminar for y'all. And let me tell you now, you're going to pay to come in. I'm telling you right now. Because I don't give the stuff away free. You should never give anything away free because it loses value. That's it. You know, it's so sad. It is so sad that when a church puts on a seminar like this and they say you got to pay $150 to come in and all the saints get mad. Hey, they sell in the gospel. Sunday coming, I'm flying to Nigeria. And I'm going to do seminars five days. One of the companies I'm doing seminars for already paid 10% down, $50,000, before I even arrive. And the saints don't even want to give an offering. Don't look now, I ain't talking to you. It's the one behind you I'm talking to. See, you want everything free. You don't understand business management. If you don't put something, don't put value on something, it's no value to you. That's why you charge. You charge to put value on it. Those books out there, listen, I could give them away free. I really could. I don't need no money from them. But if I give them away free, you won't read them. They lose their value. Don't you ever, ever again, pastors, tell anybody salvation is free. That is a lie. It is not free. He lost his life over that. It cost them everything. That's why for you to buy it, It costs you everything. He takes your life. That ain't free. Let's talk about this one more time. The money. Everybody say money. Money. Have you noticed every time you say money, you got a smile at the end? (laughs) Say it again. Money. 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 Let's read some about money. Probably 1311. Read. Dishonest money. Come on, read it. Dishonest money dwindles away, but gather money little by little makes it grow. Let's read it again. Dishonest money dwindles away. That's lottery. But he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. That's in your Bible. Saving just a little bit. You know, I I, I can't go for lunch this year because I got to take lunch from home. I I, got to save that $5 a week. You know, $5 a day. That's $60 a week, man. Can't do that. That's over 1000 bucks a year. Over 10 years, that's 10000 bucks Down payment on a property, man. Mm. Just from lunch. Mm. Little by little. Mm. Do you know that everybody in this room was a millionaire already? Let me repeat it again. Everyone in this room was a millionaire already. Time's over. (laughs) The money that went through your hands already. If you calculated the number of monies that went through your hands, you were a millionaire many times over. And you can't tell today where that went. (laughs) Here's what I want you to do. Okay, I want you to try to go home. I want you to calculate how old you are by days and then multiply it by $5. Mm. 
Just your age, five dollars a day from your age, you're a millionaire. If you had saved five dollars a day when you were born, you'd be a multi-millionaire right now at age 40. Just five bucks. It's the price of a coffee. You were drinking your wealth every day in a cup because you won't save it little by little. Look at this verse, Proverbs 17, 16, read. Of what use, come on, read it together. Of what use is money in the hands of a fool? <laughs> but since he has no desire to get wisdom, what use is it? Another verse I thought was interesting, Matthew six twenty four. read. No one can serve two masters, Jesus says. Either he will hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. <laughs> Financial solutions. Uh, oh boy. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This is a good one. Verse 10, read. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with his income. This is meaningless. You pursuing money? You never have enough, he says. It keeps running from you. Now here's the verse I think is the real killer. It's found in Ecclesiastes 10 verse 19. Read, a feast is made for laughter and wine makes the life merry. But it's money that answers everything. Tell your neighbor, mm hmm, that's right, child. Tell your neighbor, mm hmm, mm hmm, say it again, mm hmm. So, no matter how much you talk, you gotta bring up the money afterwards. You can speak in tongue, prophesy, when it's all over, you better pay that light bill. <laughs> I like that. Or you'll be prophesying in the dark, she says. <laughs> money, answer it what? All things. This is a very difficult verse to translate. The word answer it actually can have two meanings. One of them is explain. Money explains everything. You know, it's amazing. For example, if you see somebody having problems any part of their life, according to the Bible, is traced back to their capacity of money. The church ain't doing well. God says, well, you can pray all you want. There's something here to do with money. You got to check out the money problem. And when you do your research, you'll discover there's either mismanagement of money or someone stealing it, misappropriation, or bad delegation of money. Marital problems, you check it. That stress starts with money. It explains everything. You got a good idea, but you still broke? <laughs> What's the problem? Money. Ideas don't make you rich. You need money to make the ideas make riches. <sighs> explains everything. So the key is, how do you get money? Well, Luke 16. I'm not finished, but I'm going to close on this, because some of y'all can't take no more. <laughs> Luke chapter 16. Jesus had a management seminar in, G in Luke chapter 16. It's a management seminar. Here's what he taught. Uh, Jesus told his disciples in the seminar these words. Jesus said to them, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of what? wasting his possessions. So he called in the manager in the office and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management. I'm reading the Bible now. Because you cannot manage any longer. Pause for a minute. Jesus says God fires people. 
Let me go over here. They don't believe me. Maybe you'll believe me. Read it again. Somebody say, but God is faithful. No, God will fire you. Read the verse. He says, you will be manager no longer. Hmm. Give an account, he says. Show me what you did with what I give you. I tithe to protect myself. Mm. That's good. You tithe to protect yourself. You don't tithe to be the pastor. You tithe to protect yourself. Because God's watching. I don't want God to fire me. Mm. I don't want to buy things I don't need. Just to impress other people. Bad management. You know, we were we were somewhere last night. No, night before last. No, last night. I don't know when it was. <laughs> we were in a restaurant and uh, we pulled up this restaurant, you know, our driver pulled up this restaurant, the limousine, and there was a long line of kids outside a store. It was eleven PM and they were out in the cold, long line in the dark. And I asked him, what are they doing? He said, they're waiting for a new game that just came out. I shook my head. I said, how much does it cost? He said, about $400. I said, this is, is, I said, is there a crisis in America? These people need revelation. A game? They said, the store don't open until 7 a.m. in the morning, and they're waiting all night. I say, oh, God, these are the poorest people I've ever seen. Give an account, he says, of what you've done in my possessions. And then he gets a little bit excited. I got excited, too, because I don't know what's going on. Oh, my professional technician didn't put the plug in. That's bad management. <laughs> Give him a hand for poor management. Now God took away my whole series. Quick, quick, move. Don't you move it too slow now. Hey, give an account of your management. <laughs> Give him a hand for his faithfulness one more time. I got to go anyhow. Praise God. Oh, man. Anyhow, let's read it from the Bible, since it, you know, turn to Luke 16. I, I, I got to close on this. This is too good stuff. Tell your neighbor, I'm glad I came tonight. I repent. I'm going home to clean my room. Luke 16, everybody got it? Let's read it. Very important chapter. It's about management. Jesus said these words. Verse 2, you cannot be manager any longer. Verse 3, the manager said to him, to himself, what shall I do now? In other words, watch this. My master is taking away my job. Come on, read this. This is good stuff in the Bible. <laughs> Unemployment, yep. God unemploys people. There are folks who lost their job the last six months and God was behind it. Can I tell you how I know some of them lost it because of God? Okay. When a company needs to let people go, they normally look for the ones who are the most Negligent, tardy, lazy, always coming late, two hour lunch times, go home before time is off, and then drinking coffee while they should be working, reading newspaper while they should be working, they're the ones that let go first. That's called mismanagement. There are some companies who are happy for the crisis. 
they finally got justification to get rid of you because you, they would want to do it a long time ago and couldn't find a reason. Now they give God thanks for the crisis. <laughs> Hallelujah. I take the dead weight off. I'm telling you. Listen to what he says. He says, my master has taken away my job. Now watch this. He says, I am not strong enough to dig. In other words, I used to work in the office. Now I got to go work in another company. And I, my fingers ain't built for that. Retooling your skills because you're mismanaged. You got to get a job you didn't even want because you mismanaged the one you had. It's in the Bible. And then he says, and I am ashamed to beg. Pride. I got to go back and ask my mom to let us live there again. I got to go get some money from some friends now just to make ends meet. Notice, it isn't because of the devil, you know. Mismanagement. Not the devil. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, yeah? But I've sure seen some bad managers forsaken. That's good. That's true. <laughs> this gets real good. Watch this. Are you ready? Verse 4. The guy begins to change his mind. He says, I know what I will do so that I will not be fired. When I lose my job, people will welcome me into their houses. He says, I'm going to call each one of those who owe my boss money and I'm going to collect the money for them, for him and take it to him. I'm going to do what I was supposed to be doing from the beginning. <laughs> Let me go back and start organizing my life restructuring my life. Let me go and do what I'm supposed to be doing. I would delegate it to invest and collect and I've been neglecting it. Let me go back. In other words, God said, go home and clean your room. Go home and stop wasting money and take lunch in a bag. Go home and tell God, you're going to pay your tithes from now on every single Sunday, no matter what. I'm going to pay my tithes, Lord. I'm going home and fixing it. He went and fixed it. And that's why God sent me here. You know, it's amazing. People come and say, where are we going to a money seminar? Of, no, 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 no. You, you need a management seminar. Money is attracted to management. You don't pursue money. It comes after management. This guy was about to lose all of his money because he mismanaged. Now watch him. The Bible says he asked the first one how much he owed the master and then he collected it, 800 gallons of olive oil, the manager told him, okay, take the bill, sit down quickly, make it 400. So he asks, in other words, he's negotiating now to get the man's money. This is good management. This is Jesus telling the story here. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. He's telling a story. He's, it's a seminar on management, not speaking in tongues and falling out the Holy Ghost. It's management, a whole chapter. He says, manage. I love it. It says, then he asks the second one, how much do you owe the master? He says, a thousand bushels of wheat. He said, okay, take your bill and let's make it eight bushels. Just give me the money, man. And the master commended the dishonest manager while he corrected himself because he had acted what? Shrewdly. The word shrewd is not an evil word here. It means wisely. Wise, oh, I'm about to shout out by myself now. Write the word wisdom down. The word wisdom is different from the word knowledge. And there are three words that should make your life work. Three words. One, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Write them down. Knowledge is information. Write that down. Understanding is comprehension. Write that down. But wisdom is application. Write that down. You can have knowledge and understanding without wisdom. And only wisdom works. 
That's why the Bible says, all you're getting, get wisdom. Why? Wisdom is more important than knowledge and understanding because you can have knowledge and understanding, don't have wisdom. Wisdom is what? Application. If you don't apply what you know, it doesn't benefit you. Right. And so Jesus said, this manager had this knowledge all along. He's finally going home and applying it. He's managing. Now the next statement is what I want to shout on. It says, Jesus talking now. He says, the people of this world are wiser than the people who claim to have light. What is wisdom? Application. He says, the people of the world, the wicked people. <laughs> oh Lord, you still ain't getting this man. He says, look, you got the information and the comprehension, but they got the application. You talk about it, they do it. Yes. You prophesy, they profit. Yes. He says, something's wrong with this. Come on. Come on. Yes. You pray and they work it. The world is wiser than my own people, he says. They are applying what I taught my people. They get up at 6 a.m. You get up at quarter to nine, rushing to work. They leave office at 11 p.m. You want to go home to watch the movies. So he gives it to them. They're willing to manage. I have no working hours. That's why I'm debt free. I gain wealth while you're sleeping. Because you may be a little bit lazy. The Bible says a little slumber and a little sleep and poverty will take you like a bandit. Listen to me, son. If you have a job from nine to five, you're poor. Because a salary is someone's estimate of your value. Listen to me. Jobs are good. I had many of them. But your job is not your work. Your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. And you will never prosper from your job. Because someone else controls your value. And that means, listen to me carefully, you will never grow from nine to five. Because they control what you do. The only time that you own is after five o'clock. And that's when you need to grow. So you become wealthy in your downtime. Are you listening to me, son? From 9 to 5, you are employed. From 5 to 12 midnight, you are deployed. And if you ever become deployed, you'll never be unemployed. It takes more work after five o'clock to be deployed. It's management. When we say buy those books, let me tell you why you don't buy those books. Because you don't want to read. It takes too much discipline to shut that TV off. And that TV is your poverty. 
Why don't you turn 2009? You got nine more months left. Why don't you make a change tonight and say, this is the year that I turn my home into a university. This is no longer an entertainment center. It's a center for growth and development. This house. Listen, that's, that's why you, only, you are only what you made yourself. The children of this world, Jesus said, they're wiser than my own people. They got light and don't apply it. Don't they know that whoever applies my management principles, I have to give them the wealth. And if the wicked applies them, I got to give it to them. You don't believe me, hey? Okay, let's read the next verse. He said, Therefore, I tell you, I'm instructing you, go and make friends with the world. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. He just messed up your theology. Stay away from them. Don't mix with them. Don't, no, touch not. God says, go make friends with them. I don't want to mix it. I don't want to do anything. He says, look, make them your friends. Why? They got your money. <laughs> Find out what they do and to get it. Yep. Yeah. And I'm holy. Holy broke. <laughs> he says, look, read the Bible. He says, go make friends with them and use worldly wealth to gain friends. You're going to be okay, man. That's why you're here tonight. Change your thinking. So if somebody in your city is doing well, don't become jealous. Make an appointment. Yeah. What a... What an instruction. Goes against all your Pentecostal teaching. Don't mix with the wicked. God says go mix with them. They doing something that you need to learn. What are they doing? He tells us the next statement. He says, so that when it is gone, you will have welcome, you'll be welcome into eternal dwellings as well. He wants you to have wealth now and wealth later. Look at the next verse. He says, now here's what they know. Whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with what? Much. And whoever can, whoever is dishonest with little will also be dishonest with much. So if you cannot be trustworthy with handling worldly wealth, then who will trust you with true riches? If you have not been trustworthy to manage someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Management. Last part. No servant can serve two masters. I'm glad you're here tonight. Take a deep breath. <laughs> He says, look, if you cannot manage a little, you will do the same thing to much. If you cannot be trusted with little, who will trust you with much? Listen to his words now. You're missing it. In other words, <laughs> much is attracted by little. Still ain't get it? Okay. He says, look, you don't ask for much more. You manage little first. And then much comes. So, 
<laughs> so if you effectively manage the little, then the much is attracted to the effective management. So I told you, you read it just now, if you cannot manage other people's property, like this place right here, who's going to give you the rest of that? I've met people who've been asking God to give them a car, you know, praying for a car, and they ride a motorbike, and the motorbike is dirty. So God says, no car. You can't even keep a motorbike clean. See, you're asking for much and not managing the little. You in someone else's apartment, the light fixture breaks, you know, the plug doesn't work, and you get mad, all cussing and everything. There's people, God I mean, said, look, I'm watching how you fix it. Let me see you fix their plug. Treat it like it's your own. Manage other people's property, he says. That's why God gives you a job first. Can you come on time to someone else's job? I want a business. God says, no, 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 no. You need to manage someone else's business first. And then I'll give you business of your own. Every job I've ever had, they still want me back 30 years later. They see me, they say, whenever you want to come back, your position is there. Well, you are you were still our best worker in 1975. We still remember you. Never wasted time, never read the Bible on the job. Mm. Come on, come on, come on. You were always on time. You worked overtime, never asked for overpay. We still want you back. We need more people like you, they say. If you manage a little, you make a rule over much. I think I want to show you one more thing, if you'll allow me. But I don't think you can handle this story. Let me see. Yeah. I just want to show you this here from the Bible. The benefits of management. The power of management. Write this down, please. Just write this list down. And I'm going to pray for you. And then I'll come back soon. And I'm going to call a leadership management meeting. I want everybody to come. And bring all your children. Because if your teenagers learn this now, they'll be richer than you. Write this down. Number one, management is the primary goal of mankind. Number two, whatever you fail to manage, you will lose. Number three, God's primary measure of trust is management. Number four, God will give to effective management. He'll give more to it. Number five, management attracts resources. Number six, God will not give you what you ask for, only what you can manage. Money, resources, people, products, facilities, equipment, easy. Do you know who's going to benefit from this crisis right now? Those who are managing. Those who've got money put away. They're going to buy up all the cheap houses, 
Foreclosure is a blessing to those managers. They're going to buy the companies. It's not a crisis for them. It's a harvest. Because they managed over the years. I remember the Lord said to me one time, and he's talked to me in the sentences, you know, he said, what happens to you will expose whether you are a manager or a mismanager. Whatever happens to you will expose whether you are a manager or a mismanager. Hard times will always reveal to us whether you are a good manager or a bad manager. Hard times will do that. You can fake it for a long time until hard times come. Then we get to see who was a bad manager, who was a good manager. So I want to pray for you tonight. First, I'm going to pray the first prayer on this list of here. That God will burn in your mind that you were sent to earth to manage his resources. Secondly, we're going to pray that you will repent of the areas of your life that you failed to manage. For some of you, it's your marriage. For some of you, it's your children. Read number two aloud together. Go. That's why you lost your kids. That's why you're losing your marriage. Maybe that's why you lost it already. Didn't manage it. You fail to manage your body. You lose it. You don't eat the right thing. Exercise. Stuff that you know already. Sleep. Vegetables. Water. I mean, five tins of Coke a day. Come on. This is poor management. Every Coke can has 40 tablespoons of sugar in it. White sugar. Every can, 40 tablespoons in each can. Five cans of Coke a day. 200 tablespoons of white sugar. You're already dead. It's bad management. So you lose your body. You fail to manage your ministry. You lose it. Fail to manage your friendships. You lose it. I want to pray that God will give you the spirit of management. Fail to manage your money. You lose it. Fail to manage your time. You wonder where it's gone. I want to pray for that management spirit. You want God to give you more? I'm going to pray that the Lord will give you management first. 